so hari krishna prabhu hari and uh, thank you for joining shri shukla thank you and i would like to uh, host uh, this uh, facebook live session today and topic for uh, today's uh, facebook live is quite an interesting one and it's uh, fairly new i think so the topic is uh, uh, the spiritual take on self defense national defense and uh, spirituality so this is the topic and my co-host is uh, pooja uh, so i am uh, so i am an electrical engineer uh, currently based in uh, netherlands uh, and uh, i work on uh, 5g technologies pooja please introduce yourself hari krishna prabhu and so i um, i graduated from my masters program in electrical engineering as well from uh, arizona state university in usa and i graduated in 2015 and since then i been i started working uh, at intel and then i moved on later on to another company here in the bay area um, so yes and uh, i i'm really looking forward to both of us and everybody seeing from you today on on the topic thank you for joining and yes this topic is very important especially pertinent in today's times so maybe we can start with the questions then okay i i will get started so um, so uh, i have been following uh, world news and uh, and politics and uh, the scenario in pandemics uh, on a regular basis and uh, this is the the, the most uh, i'm most curious about one query that uh, admits such uh, disruptions there is so much uncertainty happening in the world uh, be it uh, in terms of our health be it in terms of our job or what's going to be there there is so much anxiety mm-hmm. and i often hear people that uh, you have a spiritual, spiritual measure so that you calm down internally but at the same time me as a citizen of uh, my country i have certain duties towards my nation and when i see take off my nation uh in in when 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 my country is uh, at the brink of a war for example uh, in such situation uh, what should be my take because there is this dichotomy of um, internal peace versus uh, although i reconcile with the fact that my country can be on a war so what is the spiritual take of on 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 war this is my first question yeah it's a very important question so first of all before we can discuss anything we need to define terms and understand concepts so what do we actually mean by spirituality now broadly speaking many people think of spirit spiritual as anything that makes us feel good so it was a very spiritual trip i felt so peaceful i felt so connected so we often associate spirituality with good emotions good thoughts good emotions which is true but that's not the only thing so basically the bhagavad gita explains that reality is tripartite physical mental and spiritual now in western intellectual traditions anything above the physical is put in one category that's why we have the phrase mind over matter or mind body duality so where the mind is used to refer to everything above the physical the differentiation between the mind and the spirit is not that clear uh, so, so when we talk about spirituality many people think about it as something that will make me feel good something that will make me feel peaceful and then if that is the conception of spirituality then we may feel well, how is it relevant if i have to do some serious activity in the world whether it is say if my country is at war and what do i do at that time now if we consider the bhagavad gita the bhagavad gita is spoken to arjuna and arjuna has to fight a war of course the context of arjuna's war was very different uh, but the point is without going into the specifics of that war arjuna thinks that to be spiritual let me let me renounce the world and be in seclusion so krishna tells him that you don't necessarily need a world rejecting spirituality you can also have a world affirming spirituality so world affirming spirituality means that our spirituality helps us function better in the world 
So how does that happen? There's the physical, the mental and the spiritual. In this categorization, if we categorize this way, that spiritual is different from the mental and the physical. So if I am to grow spiritually, does that mean I don't work at the physical or the mental levels? Not exactly. The spiritual level gives us a grounding. It gives us steadiness. Nasato vidyate bhavo, na bhavo vidyate sataha. The Bhagavad Gita explains in 2.16 that there are two kinds of reality. There is one which is constantly changing, which is the material level, physical and mental. Mm -hmm. And there is the another reality which is constantly unchanging. That is the spiritual level. So if we are in an ocean, at that time, if we are being hit by waves and swept by waves, we, we can't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Or rather, we can't do anything constructive. We are just getting swept away at that time. So if we don't want to simply get swept away, we need to hold on to something firm. Say we want to hold on to an anchor. Now, once we hold on to that anchor, then the first thing that happens is the anchor stabilizes us. Then after that, once we are stabilized, the anchor is something substantially heavy. Then we can, we can decide, okay, uh, the river is moving in this, the ocean, this, this current is moving in this way. Maybe I want to go in this way. Or maybe after that I see I can do SOS, I can call for help or whatever. But if I'm just constantly being tossed, I can't do anything. So spirituality is like the anchor. So it stabilizes us. Now, there is in the Bhagavad Gita, the understanding that spirituality is an anchor at the same which, which stabilizes people. But it is not just individual, it is also social. That means society needs to be organized with some basic, basic level of order so that people can practice spirituality. So dharma refers both to the inner harmony as well as outer harmony. When Krishna says dharma samsthapanarthaya has come, it's both ways, it's internal and external. So in today's world, spirituality is often associated with more of the inner side. So be peaceful, be calm, be connected. But spirituality also has the outer side that we act to establish order in society. Now, how may we do that? Arjuna himself was a ruler. He was a, he was a Kshatriya. Kshatriyas are martial guardians of society. So then he did work to, to actively engage in a combat in combat for protecting and reinforcing dharma now now we as spiritualists that may not be our particular role unless we are in the army or in defense forces but we are a part of a particular say particular country and whatever role we can play based on our particular position we don't play we don't play that role simply for say only for nationalistic one-upsmanship. That my country is better than your country. That's not the... So, so I, I, had a, I had a final question on that. So before we, before I get on to the nationalism aspect, uh, I had a final question. So this is quite clear to me that um, how can spirituality play a role uh, in my, in my um, for, for self when the country is at, is at war. But there is another fundamental question about, um, uh, there is this, there is this uh, dilemma about violence and non-violence. Should a country wage a war? Because uh, we often talk about uh, Vasudev Kutumbakam, where the world is a family. So, but at the same time, uh, the reality is we do have nation states. We have to defend our borders because there can be a hostile enemy. So in that case, uh, what is this uh, right, righteousness aspect of it? Should a country wage a war and how does spirituality reconcile with, uh, with, with, uh, with that dichotomy? Okay, yes. So, should a country wage a war? So generally, in today's world, we have become aware of the graphic consequences of violence more and more. Although we, we love to be entertained by seeing action movies, but we often shudder on seeing violence in real life. In fact, the current racial unrest in America 
I started because of the because of the very graphic uh, imagery of Lloyd George being being killed in the public. Well. So that's so we do recoil from violence, and that's that's desirable. Violence should be avoided as much as possible. At the same time, we need to recognize that even say, for example, the United Nations want to keep peace in some society, some place, and they send a peacekeeping force. Now, force means violence. So sometimes uh, to keep order or to sometimes you know to prevent war. One factor is deterrence. That means if the other country knows that oh, we will also have to pay a price if there is a war, then deterrence often prevents war. So, so now deterrence comes by having the preparedness for war as well as waging if it is waging it if it is required. So it's just a fact of life that we human beings are part of nature, and. Uh, of course, we are not just animals. We are, we are, we have a wall consciousness. But just as in the animal world, you cannot do away with violence. Sometimes we we live in cities, and we sometimes have a very utopian idea of the environment. Oh, the environment is is so benevolent. The environment is environment is peaceful and natural. But if you go actually into the environment, it's brutal. It is survival of the fittest. So similarly, in human society, not entirely that way, but we human beings are are there is a there we could say there is a human beings are at the junction between animalistic side and the divine side. So mm -hmm. they, we are all potential. There is a there is a dormant spark of there is a spark of divinity within all of us. So to the extent the divine side manifests within us. To that extent, the animalistic side goes down, and to the extent that animalistic side goes down, to that extent, violence will go down. So, if people are more evolved, they are more thoughtful, they are more their div div divine nature, their higher nature is manifested. Then, even when there are conflicts, they can resolve it amicably through discussions. But if if people are not sufficiently evolved, if their animalistic nature is very strong, then discussions won't work at that time. So we need to, at one level, try as much as possible to resolve conflicts through peaceful means. At the same time, we need to be prepared, if necessary, to fight. So now this leads to one question that in today's world, especially we are uncomfortable with violence, because it is associated, especially in the context of, say, religion, it becomes something very uncomfortable, isn't it? So I would like to categorically differentiate different kinds of religious violence. See, there is, there are some religions which, which inflict violence on people who believe differently. Okay, I believe this God is the, the true God. And if you worship any other God, then we will destroy you. So that, that is one kind of violence where somebody violence is done because they believe differently. Hmm? So here the, the cause of war itself is religion then in that case. Oh, yeah, no, but another that, that's, that's, yeah, exactly. Another kind of violence is, which is required in society, is if people behave disorderly way. Mm -hmm. If people behave in a way that disrupts society, then war has to, then they have to be controlled. Whether it is through the police who punish wrongdoers, or if it is a whole rogue state is acting in a wrong way, then, it, then punishment has to take place. So if we see our epics, sometimes people say that, so like Bhagavad Gita itself is talking about violence. <clears throat> the Kurukshetra war is there. Then the Ramayana is the war described. But if you see, neither of the villains, whether it is Ravan or Duryodhan, no, neither of them are exalted for their beliefs. Mm -hmm. It is for their actions. 
and even from a usual ethical sense we can understand that say ravan he abducted sita and he was not ready to resolve things feasibly at all and that was just the one of his crime before that also he had uh, he had uh, violated many women and he had been uh, reading a reign of terror which is described in the ramayana so it is not because of who he believed hmm? similarly in the mahabharat we see that duryodhana was so brazen that he tried to disrobe draupadi in public so that is like at that time not just in public it was in the court in the in the kuru court the kuru assembly normally that is the place where people go for justice so it's like somebody commits a crime they usually do it secretly so that nobody catches it if they do it publicly in full view of people that means they are really brazen but if somebody goes to a police station or a court and they commit a crime there that means they have absolutely no fear of law that's extremely brazen so duryodhana's actions were like that and again they were just one among several actions which he had done just when he was a teen he had tried to poison bhima then he had tried to burn his cousins and their mother alive so he tried many things so basically how uh, for any society to have a basic level of order a certain amount of disciplining is required and the discipline requires sometimes in using force so what applies within a state also can apply at the borders of the state so violence has to be used very cautiously but we cannot rule out violence okay. so prabhu um that actually uh, brings me to a very fundamental question which you also touched upon briefly uh, when you were talking about dharma um and about uh, different um, you know uh, different religious uh, principles related to war or motives related to war so my question is um which i wonder a lot of times how exactly do you define dharma um is it something that's really contextual like each person has their own dharma um or uh, is it something that's more of a you know universal philosophy or universal set of principles that is applicable to all of uh, human society and and going off by um you know bhagavad gita which uh, which you mentioned um you know and in that we know that um shri krishna was uh, guiding arjuna uh, to fight the battle to protect dharma so i just want to understand um you know um how do we collectively as today's society in our own roles uh protect dharma and but to begin with um if you could help us understand how exactly should we understand dharma what does it really mean okay now dharma it is commonly translated as religion say hindu dharma christian dharma muslim dharma it is also translated sometimes as duty so we all should do our dharma both of them are valid translations at the same time we can go deeper so the word dharma etymologically comes from the word dhru dhru also leads to the word like dharan dharan is to sustain so dharma refers to that which sustains a thing dharma refers to that which makes a thing that thing say for example the dharma of salt is saltishness the dharma of sugar is sweetness so we could say the defining characteristic of something which makes it what it is that is dharma now in this context we could say dharma is like a innate attribute of that thing however dharma is not in that sense static we could say for all of us dharma is that activity that brings us in harmony so you could translate dharma as harmony that how are we who we are say for example if say all all of us are indians now if we have to speak french or portuguese or some other language we could speak but we are not as comfortable as we are speaking in our own language whichever is our mother tongue or which is the language we are comfortable at so basically 
those activities that help us to come to harmony with the bigger holes that we are a part of that is our dharma so for example we have a dharma towards our body you know bathing properly eating properly resting properly what that's that's dharma towards the body we are a part of a family that is a dharma to the family or a simple way to understand dharma is say if you are driving on a road then we are individual units at the same time we are parts of the whole road transport system and to to follow dharma means to follow the traffic rules okay go on the left side or the right side depending on which country you are in go within the speed limits don't change lanes rapidly uh, suddenly abruptly whatever so dharma is that which keeps us in harmony so in harmony with our own body mind harmony with our family harmony with our community harmony with our country harmony with nature ultimately harmony with the divine if we consider the broad vedic context it is said that we belong to three holes three broader circles it's called adhi atmik adhi bhautik and adhi daivik adhi atma refers to our body mind hmm? so normally if you see in many hindu ceremonies they start or end with om shanti 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 so three times they say that why is that because all these three holes they can make us ashanta so our body mind body is sick the mind is uh, disturbed then we become ashanta we lose peace the people around us either individually they somebody can speak hurtfully or collectively there can be unrest that can make us ashanta or the bigger whole nature which we are part of so adhi adhi atmik adhi bhautik and adhi daivik we are a part of the environment nature and that can also cause unrest like the pandemic is there so there are hurricanes floods so all these so the idea is shanti 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 that's a invocation that all these three circles become peaceful and the idea is how at one level we may invoke that kind of peacefulness at another level we also seek to bring about that peacefulness by our activities so dharma refers to those activities that help us harmonize with the whole that we are part of and that's how the activities of dharma sustain our existence so in that sense dharma is not just one predefined code say for example the rules of india the rules of america some rules may vary so generally following the rules of the broader whole which are part like traffic rules that's dharma but now dharma is also at multiple levels and the highest dharma is that which connects with the highest reality the highest reality is the divine in the bhagavad gita it is krishna so at the start of the bhagavad gita arjuna has a dharma sambrahma sambrahma is confusion or delusion so what is the dharma sambrahma basically he has two duties pulling him in two different directions there is this kula dharma and there is a kshatriya dharma kula dharma refers to his dynastic duty so normally if we know somebody is our relative we want to help them if they are in trouble we, we want to do something to help them that's that's part of the that part of the responsibility of being in a particular family or a greater whole so that was his duty that he wanted to protect the kuru vamsha so there were at the same time he was a kshatriya the kshatriyas are martial guardians of society and those who are disruptors of social order those who are Uh, those who act in anti-social ways, they need to be punished. Now, what do we do if the wrongdoers are our relatives? So that was the dilemma for Arjuna. His Kula Dharma said, "Kula told him that you need to protect them. You can't fight against them." But Kshatriya Dharma told, "Fight against them." So that was his confusion at the start of the Gita. Both were dharmas, but which dharma to give priority to? So the Gita concludes. One of its concluding verses, eighteen sixty-six, where it says, "Sarva dharman parityajya mame kam sharan amraja aham tuam sarva pape bhyo moksha ishami maashu chaha." 
the sarva dharman paritajya. Krishna says, give up all dharmas. Now this can seem a little confusing. Why should, why will God tell us to give up dharma? Hmm? The point is that he is not telling us to give up dharma and become adharmic. Rather, sarva dharman paritajya maam ekam sharanam raja. Surrender to me. So harmonizing with God, doing his will is the highest dharma. So Krishna is telling Arjuna, when you are confused about all these dharmas, don't get caught in the technicalities. Follow that dharma which will help you to surrender to me. And then at the end of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna doesn't tell Arjuna, I will fight. Krishna says, Karishe Vachinam Tava, that's 1873, the seven verses after this. So Karishe Vachinam Tava is, I will do your will. So the Bhagavad Gita's call is not for Arjuna to fight a war. The Bhagavad Gita, I say that Bhagavad Gita is not a book of violence. It is not a book of silence. It is a book of transcendence. Transcendence, how do we harmonize with the will of God? And that is the conclusion. Now, in Arjuna's particular context, harmonizing with the will of God meant that he fight the war. That is, he did the Kshatriya Dharma. But he was not self-identifying, I am a Kshatriya and I am fighting. He was self-identifying himself, I am, I, am, I am Brahma, I am Atma. I am a spiritual being and I am living in harmony with the Supreme Spiritual Being. So Dharma, we could say in that sense, we can have multiple levels of Dharma. So we have, as I said, family dharma, bodily dharma, then social dharma. Now people, people talk about environmental dharma. So we can also have, so ultimately the highest is our devotional dharma or bhakti dharma to the divine. So with this understanding of the word dharma, is dharma, dharma in that sense is like a compass. It gives us a direction in which we to go. It's not necessarily like a set of codes which are given in a particular book that we have to follow. It's more that we develop a, a compass, a sensibility. Yes, there are, there, are, there are guidelines given, but it is not simply by following the guidelines that we become dharmic, but rather by understanding the principle, the purpose behind them, then we can know how to practice dharma in different situations. So Prabhu, in that case, uh, can we then conclude that um, it's sort of saying that it is indeed subjective, uh, but then uh, what we should keep in our keep in mind is the uh, the purpose that is in our mind while doing a certain task. So here, where does this moral compass of right and wrong come in? Because my right can be your wrong and your wrong can be my right. So that is also very subjective. So what is the dharmic take on on righteousness? What is wrong and what is right? Or or is it like if my purpose is clean, I have a I have a transcendence purpose, as you rightly pointed out, then it doesn't matter what is wrong, what is right or... Uh, okay. So see, uh, somehow I would hesitate to use the word subjective and objective over here. I would use the word contextual and universal. Because, see, it's, it's not, for example, if I'm driving in America or driving in India, it's not subjective. It is... It's objective because everybody in America has to drive on a particular side of the road. Everybody in India has to drive on a particular side of the road. So it's not just a matter of individual opinion. It's a matter of particular context. So I hope the difference is clear. Subjective is just all in the mind. Mm -hmm. uh, contextual is, it's not just in the mind. The mind is also there, but we have to look at the context. So there's a, there is a context which could be a physical reality. It's not so subjective and objective. It, it, I would say that those are words which you need to be cautious about using them. But let's use contextual and universal. So okay. now, now the point is well taken that there are universal categories. There is right and there is wrong. So for example, we might say that speaking lies is a bad thing. Uh, on dishonesty is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, without a basic level of honesty, no society can function. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, if you have e-commerce going on, when the e-commerce started, you know it could have been very easy for people to. You know, uh, somebody sends a promises a good product, but they send a defective product, and mm -hmm. somebody promises to pay, but they send a check that bounces. 
Now, if both sides had been untrustworthy, it would never have taken off. So there's a basic level of trust. And that's how things move forward. Even say, for example, families. Now, if there is no trust, if there is betrayal, it can be devastating. So the idea is honesty is, is, is a good thing. So if somebody asks us something to speak truthfully, to speak truthfully is a good thing. So for example, if there's a, uh, if there's a, if there's a argument, no, not being violent is a good thing. So there is, there are black and white as categories. At the same time, there is also shades of gray in between. So how do we understand? Is it that something is right for me and something is right for you? Not entirely, sub, not entirely subject to, I would say it's contextual. Contextual means we look at three things. There is the intent, there is the content and there is the consequence. Why am I doing? What am I doing? And what is the result of it? What is its result? So what is a particular person's dharma at a particular time? That depends on these three factors. So for example, within the broad dharmic traditions, it is said that we should be truthful. Suppose there is a story in the Puranas that there was a slaughterer who was about to, who was trying to slaughter a cow and that cow broke free and ran. And there was a sage who was sitting under a tree, meditating and praying. And then he heard the sound of this cow running. And so he was sitting at a crossroad. One road went this way, another road went this way. So then the cow came and the cow ran in the right direction. And then the butcher came running after that. And the butcher saw, he, said, he asked the sage, where did the cow go? Now what should he do? If he speaks the truth, the cow will die. If he speaks a false, then he has violated the principle of speaking truthfulness. So what has happened over here is, he could say that if he's a literalist, this is the letter of the law and that's what I'll stick to. Then the result would be that he would not be able to fulfill the purpose of the law. Ultimately to speak truthfully is so that society can be orderliness. But in, in exceptional situations, one may sacrifice that principle or subordinate that principle to a higher principle. So that's why it is contextual. There are categories or there are universal categories of things that are right and wrong, but those universal categories may not apply in the exact same way in all contexts. So we have to consider the context. Does it answer the question? Well, yeah, exactly. Have... Thank you. Yes. Yeah, Puja, Puja, go ahead. I think uh, from uh, uh, what you mentioned about what is dharma and then also from this answer, I think uh, to add on to it, I feel like um, what I understand from it is basically um, anything when it is done with the purpose, any activity, any social order, anything in society or individually, when it is done with the larger purpose of harmonizing our inner self with uh, the divine uh, or with um, the universal, uh, you know, um, consciousness, uh, then that is actually moving in the direction of dharma. And such activities are what, um, as a society, we must collectively protect and promote for human harmony and for human happiness. So that, so that's my understanding of it. But the other thing that I want to ask you is, um, you know, uh, people of, you know, Shishir and my age group, like our, our youth, today basically when you especially talk about things like um, religion or you know, faith um, in God or like you mentioned that in Bhagavad Gita uh, Sri Krishna says that uh, you know um, sur surrender to me uh, which I'm sure um, there's a lot to it that we can understand but when you would say that to somebody from the youth of today you know there's just such a sense of um, you know like maybe repulsion or questioning or rejection like you know why should I or why religion like there's just such a sense of I guess this um, repulsion related to religion um, so 
and i also feel like personally um i can relate to that a little bit because sometimes um you know growing up i i felt like um uh, my understanding of religion was festivals and rituals and formality and family gathering and food uh <laughs> and i feel like a lot of times when i was really um going through difficult times in life i don't know how to relate you know rituals or festivals with my inner struggles you know so i feel like sometimes the spiritualism or spiritual aspect of religion can get hidden behind uh what we see on the outside uh but at the same time uh, you know through my personal experience again i know that as you also mentioned that a spirituality or a religious faith actually can be such a strong anchor point for our lives uh, when we are going through difficult times or even just through the realities of our daily life so my question to you is uh, prabhu ji that um, you know what are your thoughts on religion or faith or um, i think spirituality is something more accepted by people universally but it's religion or faith that's very you know controversial and contested in that sense um, and also uh do you see uh, you know what do you think should be the place and purpose of this in our life are these means to an end or are they an end in itself or are they just you know stress busters or more foundational for for our lives it's a big question many different aspects in it thoughtful one so i'll divide this into some parts first is that uh, religion is associated more with rituals and festivals and food and things like that is yes, that is true now what is there any relationship between spiritual and religious there's a yeah there's a whole group of people who self identify themselves as sbnr call themselves as spiritual but not religious and the idea is that they often associate religion with narrow mindedness with the dogmas with the superstitions sectarianism violence and they are also the spirituality with calmness connectedness forgiveness and various virtues like that so also spirituality is associated with meaning and purpose in life a means for developing inner strength so so spirituality has a very positive connotation religion has quite a negative connotation now this differentiation is relatively recent you know if we consider even the time of albert einstein he talks about the deep religious feeling that i get when i observe the symmetry of the universe and when i see the order and discern that order in the universe he talks about a religious sentiment and then he talks about he says that the sciences the arts and the religions are all fruits of the same tree of human knowledge so when he is talking about the word religion at that time this rigid differentiation between religion and spirituality was not there it came especially from the 1960s the counter culture in the west where the hippies and others started exploring eastern spirituality in contradistinction in contradistinction to the prevalent western religions at that time and from that time spirituality and religion became increasingly differentiated everywhere but specifically if we could say spirituality is a state of consciousness hmm? not just a state of mind but a state of consciousness our mind keeps changing but consciousness is something which is more foundational it's about say for example uh, how do i differentiate in state of mind and consciousness see we our desires our feelings may keep changing but our values they don't change so fast so for example uh, if you you have a job now sometimes you may like your work sometimes you may not like your work but still you understand this job is important for me so we value it so if 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 parents have children sometimes the children can can be very annoying sometimes it can be very irritating so we not feel very pleasantly toward them but we still we value them so spirituality is not just a state of mind the mind keeps changing constantly spirituality goes much deeper it is a state of consciousness consciousness associated with our values by values means what is it that we really value in our life what is it that gives meaning and purpose to our life 
so originally religion was meant to raise our consciousness to the spiritual level so if we consider the material level of consciousness and the spiritual level so the practices that help us to raise our consciousness to that spiritual level that was what was called as religion mm -hmm. uh, so some people who say that i am spiritual but not religious but they may also have certain practices they may do some meditation they may do some asanas and they they may be elevating their consciousness by that so whatever one does to become spiritual that could be called as their religion so in that sense if somebody says i want if somebody is sick and they say i want to become healthy without taking any medicine well no to take to become healthy you have to take some medicine now you may have had bad experiences with a particular kind of medicine maybe allopathy has backfired you want to try try something else that's okay but you need to follow something somebody say no i will only fast well that's also a regimen i only fast i only take natural foods so you're following something even if not medication so the idea is i cannot go from disease to health automatically simply by desiring it i have to do follow something for that so we can't become spiritual simply by thinking that i want to be spiritual we follow some process for that and the process that we follow that we may not be comfortable with using the word religion for it but originally that was what religion was meant for but unfortunately so so, so prabhu can we then conclude that this this word religion itself by categorizing certain things in the in the gamut of religion uh, so that that naming itself is very confusing then right because uh, because as you are saying unknowingly we are doing lot of things which can be religious but we don't name it so so is there a catch in that that it's just a name that that it is religion and it is not so it is it is that yeah it's just it's just a name but it's a name which is widely used so we and it refers to certain things so we can't wish away that name but we have to see uh, whether that what is implied when somebody says i am not religious what do they mean by that they mean certain things so for example when uh, when i speak in american university sometimes people say that no, i don't believe in god so okay then okay fine so which god do you not believe in so i don't believe in any god okay but tell me uh, what is your conception of god says i don't believe in a god who sends people to hell if they don't accept him as their savior and then i say even i don't believe in that god you know the bhagavad gita doesn't talk of belief it talks about behavior belief is important but behavior is even more important the bhagavad gita talks that our destination depends on whether we behave properly so it's not so the idea is that so people when they talk about god they have a particular conception in their mind and we need to understand the so terms and concepts they are related how are they related if we have a suitcase big suitcase we can't just carry the whole suitcase on our head we need a handle so the handle is the term and the suitcase is the concept now say if you are in the baggage carousel i it happened once with me that um, i was traveling from uh, from florida to georgia in america so uh, just when i was about to leave my suitcase broke the handle broke so because i had to rush my host gave me another suitcase and then by the time i got down in georgia then i came to the baggage carousel i had forgotten because it was a suitcase i had just got it i forgot the exact color of the suitcase so i remembered that the handle was bluish so then i was picking up all the suitcases with that handle checking is this my suitcase is it my suitcase so the same handle or a similar handle could be there for many suitcases isn't it so we have to make sure that the handle and the suitcase are both well connected so the word religion can mean many different things and rather than say rejecting the word religion we have to see which suitcase that handle is attached to what concept people have of that term when they use the term religion so if people don't want to use the word religion that's fine so nowadays the word tradition has become quite acceptable you know according to my tradition we do this 
or like, this is my traditional understanding. So tradition is fine. Sometimes even these are my practices. That's also fine. So, but to explain this point that if you consider, I talked about rising from material to spiritual. You could put it in a different way that if you have the bottom of the bottom of a mountain and top of the mountain, and there could be different ways to go up from the bottom to the top. But the key thing is, it's not that all paths will take us up the mountain. There are certain objective criteria. If a path is taking me up the mountain, my elevation should become higher and higher. Uh, the peak should come closer and closer. So we could say there are there are there could be many different paths to grow spiritual. But that doesn't mean any path that I think is spiritual is spiritual. Hmm? Whether it is actually elevating me, that we have to test. So, uh, so that's the difference between religion and spirituality. Religion is meant to be provided as the practices by which we can raise our consciousness to the spiritual level. But unfortunately, people do the activities without understanding their purpose. And when that happens, then religion becomes more ritualistic. So as you may have heard, the spirit plus ritual becomes spiritual. So when we infuse the performance of rituals with the spirit, so when we have festivals, as you said, festivals, for example, Diwali is mostly about firecrackers and food. But Diwali each day has a profound significance. Now we are commemorating certain incidents in the history of the cosmos and they all have universal significance for uplifting our consciousness. So that spirit is infused into the ritual, then it will become spiritual. Okay. So I just want to ask you, um, then now there's just such an established way of uh, celebrating or um, um, you know, celebrating festivals or following a certain religion. There's such an established way, which is predominantly, mostly ritualistic. I mean, if I talk about celebrating, for example, Diwali today, when I'm trying to understand the significance of Diwali or the universal principles that it adheres to, people will be like, what are you doing? Come burst firecrackers, you know? So I'm just saying there's such an established way of uh, following religion. But I feel like, isn't it at the same time so important that we uh, break free from that in a sense and look at the deeper perspective of it and collectively as a society move towards the deeper aspect of religion and redefine religion rather than running away from it. Um, yes. Don't you think that's yes. important and how do we do it? How do we address this big uh, task? Yeah, okay, good point. That if I most of the time religion goes towards ritualism and its higher purpose is forgotten. So how do we bring about that uh, higher purpose being centralized, be brought more central in the practice of religion? Yes. I would like to use one example here. In, in the spiritual path, there are two aspects we could say. There is, as I said, there's a path which takes us up, climbing up, there are processes for going up. That is like the religion, the practices. So spirituality has two aspects. There's philosophy and there is religion. Philosophy gives us an understanding of what is the nature of what is the nature of things. So in a sense, you could say it's in science there is theory and experiment. Or within science, you could say there is a theoretical research and there is the practical application of that research. Both ways. Now in general, then consider the internet itself. The number of people who understand how the internet works are far lesser than the number of people who use the internet. Isn't it? The practical application goes to far, far more people and the theoretical analysis, theoretical understanding is for relatively far lesser people. But those few people are also very important. So similarly, with respect to spirituality, the philosophical analysis and understanding, even traditionally, it was known to few people. And the practical application in terms of the religious practices, that was widespread. It was not just religious practices. In fact, we could say in many ways, religion permeated the entire culture in the past. 
even for example classical forms of dance like bharatanatyam classical forms of music they were all they were all infused with a devotional purpose most much of the art was devotional so it's so in general the number of people who experienced some upliftment by doing the religious rituals they were also quite large they might not be able to rationally explain why this makes me feel good why this uplifts me but they were experiencing their benefit now in today's world two three different factors have taken place one is that we have lots of sources of entertainment which can make us feel good without necessarily need, needing anything traditional or cultural or religious in fact comparatively speaking religion seems more of a chore or a austerity than entertainment is available in so many different ways secondly we also live in a we also grow up in a education which is largely non theistic it's not explicitly atheistic but it is non theistic and within that we it's good that we are also encouraged to have a questioning spirit and unfortunately many of the uh, in in general those who were the intellectual classes they were expected to be teachers and also to some extent priests who perform the rituals technically but most most of the times the uh, today the religious the religious office bearers if you want to use the word the religious authorities they mostly are priests rather than teachers so when with the rational questioning spirit there are questions which we get there is no one to answer those questions and that's why these rituals if why should i do this oh that's because our tradition we do it all this that doesn't make sense so if there are no answers given then people just uh, stop doing those because there are so many alternatives and these don't make sense and thirdly also we live in a world where overall if we consider religion religion does inspires many people to do good things for example so many people are charitable and so many religious places give free food and they have run some charitable initiatives but those rarely come in the public media, public eye in the media they are very rarely reported because in a sense those are regularly going on but what is reported is some incidents of extremism or in this violence happened this mob this thing happened and overall people see religion more as a source of trouble than benefit although it's not necessarily like that in fact if we consider so uh, i in one of my books i will answer this elaborate the elaborately that if you consider the recent wars the first world war second world war and most of the wars in the last century none of them were involving religion but the idea that religion causes violence is very prominently uh, caught uh, the public imagination today and because of that religion is uh, often trivialized scorned and rejected so what can we do about it one is you know especially emphasize the educational aspect and because of the internet we also have access to lots of resources where if we ask questions and seek answers we do get those answers gradually so that way if we get the answer we seek and get answers and then we can share those answers with others so if we can increase the educational awareness about the philosophy then that can make a significant difference and if in some ways for many people they accept spirituality but they reject religion so for such people if we can somehow explain the connection between the two yes some of the many of much of what goes on in the name of religion today is not spiritual but that doesn't necessarily mean everything that goes on in the name of religion is not spiritual so if there is again proper education and then by that education we see the value in what was there in the tradition and we adopt that then surely a change can happen and i would say a spiritual awakening is happening in many ways say for example in india still many people consider that to start eating non vegetarian food is 
is modern. So people grow up in maybe cultured families and they don't eat meat. But then they start eating meat and they think, hey, I'm becoming modern now. But if we come to America, and the, not just America, Western world, becoming vegetarian, becoming vegan, that is considered cool. So what is happening is that we are moving in various ways toward more uh, uh, traditional and harmonious ways. It's not major, but it is, it is significant. Okay. Yes, I totally, totally uh, can see that. Um, I mean, uh, when I was in India, I had a completely different picture of many things. But when I came here, I see how many people are actually seeking Eastern philosophy and our way of life. And there are so many people that I personally know who want to uh, become vegan or are trying to become vegetarian. And, and now there's science backing all that. So uh, the Western world is actually speaking up more for Eastern philosophy than you know, our own um, Eastern world is my observation. Yeah, that's definitely. So, Prabhu, uh, I think uh, I think we are approaching the end of the session. However, um, I must um, uh, bring to your notice that we have totally digressed from the topic. But, <laughs> yes. However, I did not I did not want to stop you because this was so enlightening. Uh, so these questions by Pooja, uh, this also touched the chord with me that how should we reconcile with spirituality, religion, faith amongst youth. However, uh, before we close, I must get back to the topic, and maybe this will be the last question you can address related to this topic and then we can uh, we can uh, finish this so uh, talking about uh, nationalism and uh, war and what is the role of spirituality there is another thing uh, which 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 is happening around the world so this is sort of linked with uh, nationalism uh, so there is immense uh, immense role of propaganda that's been going on, going on and this is mainly because of uh, internet and social media so social media has both uh, good and bad sides to it. Uh, but then uh, we are seeing that increasingly people are using uh, internet to, to create propaganda which, uh, which suits their uh, narrative. So this creates a lot of tension and confusion amongst people who are less aware of things. And people become extremely delusional and they only see bad things happening. And in, in, in such case also uh, people question this whole concept of nationalism. So. As I often say that nationalism and patriotism are two different things. I love my country, I'm patriotic, but I love my country and my country is the only great country, that is nationalism. So it, it's pushing the limits. So, so in all such cases, uh, what, what, is a, what is a spiritual take on, um, on, on, on nationalism, so to say, and, and how should one uh, try to sort of isolate it himself with propaganda because there is no way that you can avoid yourself. It's bound to touch you. Okay, that's a good question. <clears throat> so, you no, know, nowadays the idea is that nationalism is bad, and uh, there is so much social media propaganda. So, how do we see this, also spiritually as well as practically? Now, there are two distinct things. First, I'll talk about spirituality in generic terms. See, spirituality broadly, we could say, as I said, elevating our consciousness from the material to the spiritual level. Another way of it, understanding it is expanding our consciousness. That expanding our consciousness from self-centeredness to selflessness. So a person who thinks only about myself, that person can't really be very spiritual. So then the expansion of consciousness from myself can expand to my family. It can expand to my community. It can expand to my country. It can expand to the world. It can expand to, to not just the human world, but it can expand to the non-human the non, the non world also, or the, as now it is called, more than human world also. So there can be an expansion of consciousness and ultimately it reaches the divine. And so now we, for a functional level, we need various anchors for our consciousness or various uh, various frameworks for functioning in the world. So we could, we, we could have a universe, universalist idea that we are all human beings. We all belong to one family. Why do we need nations? Why do we need nationalism? So basically this narrative started to some extent, many factors, but primarily it started at the second world war in Europe because the two wars happened very rapidly and both wars started in Europe among various countries. 
in Europe and then they flamed all over the world. So when the United Nations was formed at that time, the world itself, United Nations. So the European Union was on further attempt in that direction that we try to dissolve national boundaries and thereby we will decrease the chances of conflicts among nations. And overall, it was seen that nationalism or the idea that we belong to a particular nation that can cause conflicts. But that was a very blinkered view of reality. Mm -hmm. Now, especially with the pandemic spreading, everybody started recognizing the importance of national boundaries. Every country is trying to border, uh, protect so that the infection doesn't spread indiscriminately to their country. So, no ism is intrinsically bad, nor is it intrinsically good. So the idea, if we say nationalism is bad, then do we mean internationalism is good? Well, not necessarily is internationalism good because you know it might be that we may want to have an international consciousness, but some countries might just use that international consciousness to exploit other countries. So basically people are different. Individuals are different, different countries are led by different leaders. So we can't, we can't actually have a dissolution of all material boundaries at a material level. At a spiritual level, everyone is equal. At a spiritual level, everyone is equal. At a, spirit, at a material level, everybody is functionally different. And so as far as nationalism is concerned, the word nationalism itself has a negative connotation in today's world. Patriotism, as you said, has a positive connotation. Nationalism is also often associated with the word fascism. fascism. So where the idea is that you're becoming, this is your, so we could say to, to believe that I love my country and my country is special. This is, there's nothing wrong in that. But to consider my country supreme, there's a difference between special and supreme. The same principle you can apply to religion also. If a particular person is following a religion, my religion is special. That's fine. But my religion is supreme. As soon as I start saying that, then that will lead to conflicts. So we cannot dissolve our individuality for the sake of unity. We want unity. But unity will come by harmony of individuals, by harmonization of individuals, not by the dissolution of individuality. So can nations, uh, can nationalism lead to conflicts? Yes, of course it can. But you know, if we did a thought experiment, say so tomorrow morning, we woke up with all the things that differentiate us removed. Say we all belong to the same race, same gender, same language, same country, same culture, same belief system or non-belief system or whatever. By tomorrow afternoon, we would find 100 things to start fighting over. It is not that these factors cause fighting. It is not that nationalism cause fighting. It is people who, uh, who are possessive, who are power hungry, they use various excuses for fighting. So we cannot, so in that sense, from a spiritual perspective, nationalism is another designation, just like the idea that I am, I am a male, I'm a female, that is a designation of the body. Similarly, that I am, I am, belonging to a particular caste or a particular race, that's a designation. Similarly, by belonging to a particular country is a designation. So from a spiritual perspective, these designations need to be transcended. From a practical perspective, we need to make sure that these designations are used constructively. How, what do you mean used constructively? That in the Bhagavad Gita, for example, in the second chapter, 13th verse, Arjuna tells Krishna, that you are essentially a spiritual being. You are not a physical creature. But in the next verse, 2.14, immediately he refers to Arjuna twice with names that refer to his physical connections. Matras Parshas to Kaunteya. Kaunteya is the son of Kunti. Matras Parshas to Kaunteya. Shitoksha Sukha Dukkada. 
ಆಗಮ್ ಅಪಾಯಿನೋ ನಿತ್ಯ ಸ್ಥಾನ್ ಸ್ಥಿತಿಕ್ಷ ಸ್ವಭಾರತ ಭಾರತ ಯುರ್ ಡಿಸೆಂಡ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಭಾರತ ಡೈನಸ್ಟಿ ಸೊ ಸೊ ಇಫ್ ಇಸ್ ಆಲ್ರೆಡಿ ಟೋಲ್ಡ್ ಇನ್ ಯುರ್ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುಯಲ್ ಬೀಂಗ್ ದೆನ್ ವೈ ಇಸ್ ಇ ರೆಫರಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಹಿಮ್ ವಿತ್ ಇಸ್ ಮಟೀರಿಯಲ್ ಕನೆಕ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ದ ಐಡಿಯಾ ಇಸ್ ದಟ್ ಯೆಸ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಬಾರ್ನ್ ಟು ಅ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಮದರ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಬಾರ್ನ್ ಇನ್ ಅ ಇಲಸ್ಟ್ರಿಯಸ್ ಡೈನಸ್ಟಿ ದೇರ್ ಫೋರ್ ಆಕ್ಟ್ ಇನ್ ಅ ರೆಸ್ಪಾನ್ಸಿಬಲ್ ವೇ ಆಕ್ಟ್ ಇನ್ ಅ ವರ್ದಿ ವೇ so whatever social designations we may have if they can be insp- they can be used to inspire people to act in a responsible way in a noble way in an uplifting way then they serve a purpose so if the love for country can make people say decrease their self centeredness or selfishness and contribute to a cause bigger than themselves then that is good so but if it makes people start fighting with each other that is bad so the concept itself is a functional reality we can't dissolve it but we have to be careful how it is utilized and especially if we have a spiritual understanding and then we see the function of we see the purpose of various designations then we can use those designations constructively is that address your question yes yes that, that was that was really enlightening i think uh, so we are uh, coming to an end of the session and uh, i i i did make a lot of notes and the, the the best part that i liked if if i were to take a key key uh, conclusion from here the best and new part to me was uh, if i see spirituality from the perspective that it is not part of the self but it is part of the consciousness itself and it it is an aspect and it's a facet of your consciousness so it itself is a higher reality so it's not associated associated with the material self so if i see things from that perspective it it itself answers a lot of questions so uh, one must use spirituality to raise its consciousness and then things automatically fall um, in perspective and with the with the nationalism uh, aspect of it uh, prabhu ji uh, very rightly uh, concluded that uh, definitions don't matter it's it's just like another dogma but uh, what is how do we use it to uh, to have a, a to 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 create a meaningful uh, meaningful conclusion out of it so so that matters uh, so that that was that was my uh, take from it puja uh, do you like to conclude and uh, then we have final words from uh, prabhu ji and then we wind up Sure. Yeah, I for me the uh, best part that I liked was when you mentioned about climbing that mountain and how there could be many ways of climbing that mountain, many spiritual paths to reaching that level of consciousness. But not every way will lead to climbing the mountain. So I think I really want to take that back that uh, whatever we are engaging in as a religion or as a spirituality to uh, to elevate our consciousness, we have to like be. um kind of engage in an experimental trial and error way and see where we are headed and um and and orient our activities such that they harmonize with that universal consciousness for our own happiness and i also liked how you said that nationalism um is not about um um uh, you know destroying those individual boundaries but rather um transcending them um I really yeah that's another thing that I took back and to conclude the session Prabhu ji I would like to request you to maybe uh, lead us into a small you know small prayer or anything for world peace or something uh, you know just to end on a prayer note <laughs> okay yes. you may know this prayer that is a beautiful thought that <clears throat> there are different versions of this prayer but essentially the idea is that we seek the welfare of everyone सर्वे सुखिना भवन्तु सर्वे सन्तु निरामयम् सर्वे बद्राणि पश्यन्तु न क्वचित् दुःख भाग भवेत् सो मे एवरीवन बी हैप्पी मे एवरीबॉडी बी फ्री फ्रॉम डिसीज मे देयर बी ऑस्पिशियसनेस फॉर एवरीवन एंड मे देयर बी नो डिस्ट्रेस फॉर एनीवन इट्स अ ट्रेडिशनल वैदिक प्रेयर एंड वी ऑल कैन ऑफर दैट स्पेशली इन टुडेस टाइम ऑफ क्राइसिस So thank you very much for your thoughtful questions. Uh, it is a, it is a pleasure being with both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Prabhu, and Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.